Community Conversations, presented by the Steve Fund. Hi, my name is Micah Wilson, and I work for the Steve Fund. Thank you for joining us for another Community Conversations live webinar. Today, the topic is Parents and Students Together, Coping with a Full House During Crisis and Reflections on Current National Climate. COVID-19 and the current national climate on race has changed the dynamics in many households. Our panelists today will explore how they as parents are coping and embracing a full house again. We ask their children to join them for, for the student perspective. Many of you will be able to relate to the challenges our panelists face, and hopefully you will learn new ways of coping and improving the relationship you have with the student in your house. Remember, we still have the summer ahead of us. Our co-moderators today are Diane Morales and her son, Ben. Diane is a candidate for New York City mayor in 2021. She also has in her house her daughter, Gabby, her parents, and partner, Greg. Ben is a senior at SUNY Albany studying public policy, and he has been actively protesting in Brooklyn. Joining them are our panelists, Myrna Forney. She's an associate with Abrams Finster Men et al. law firm. Her house includes four children ranging in age from 23 to 16. And she also has her husband, Michael, holding down the fort with her. Joining Myrna is her daughter, Mackenzie. Mackenzie is a junior at the University of Southern California. She is majoring in urban studies and planning, focused on international development. She is currently on track to graduate with honors. Dr. Kelly Ishmael is a licensed psychologist and works at Ossining High School. Her son, Max, just graduated from college and is back home as well. Representing the student perspective for the Ishmael household is Helen. Helen is a junior at Farley Dickinson University, majoring in graphic design. She's also a college athlete playing basketball for the university. We have representation from the West Coast. We have John Liu and his son, Coltrane. John is an investment manager and former lawyer. He also has a daughter, but she has decided to stay at school. Coltrane is a sophomore at the University of Oregon, majoring in architecture. Thank you panelists all for joining us. We are all connected in some way and I appreciate your presence and your insights today. Diane, Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you, Micah, really appreciate it. It's, it's wonderful to be here um, with all of you for this very important conversation that I think several weeks ago would have been critical and, and timely, um, but in light of the current circumstances across the country is even more urgent and critical for us to have. It's not lost upon me that um, today there were memorials held for George Floyd um, across the country, but particularly in Minneapolis and here um, in New York City. So um, I think that this should be a, a, a very useful conversation and I'm hoping that we will, that this will be natural and, and we'll just go with the flow. Um, thinking that maybe we should start with the, the very first question of, of how, in fact, has the national, the current national climate, the escalating uh, police brutality and, and the increasing protests countrywide impacted our, our lives at home and, and the dynamics between all of us? Yeah, so why don't, why don't we open up with uh, the Ishmael's and um, Helen, maybe you can give like the student perspective of just, you know, being, uh, being at home during this difficult time. Yeah, can you guys see me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, obviously there's a lot going on. And um, one thing that, with these protests going on, um, one thing that I'm seeing amongst my peers is that we're taking count of who who's really on our side and in our corner during um, these protests mm -hmm. and then the impact on social media as well. Um, 
there's a lot of like challenges and posts and donation links and petitions going around and it takes a lot to post a square and think to be you know woke on the whole situation but it's a lot to actually use your voice and use your platform um and that's one thing that um i've been taking into account and then just being home with this whole covid thing um has been interesting as well um and you know i'm i'm 20 years old i'm not 18 anymore so i like to use my voice um with my mom and with my fellow peers so um it's a lot different um the dynamic being that the last time we were home together was two years ago and i was in high school um so we've been we've been struggling trying to mesh two schedules together but um we've been making it work and i think it's helped our relationship a lot um kelly um a week ago your son wasn't home um i don't want to get too personal here but being being a parent of a black son how was it you know wanting him home during all of this like what can you describe that like trying to balance protecting your son versus letting him be a college graduate how do you balance that as a parent that's an excellent question uh because i'm struggling with that uh, currently right now, because there was one night, uh, well, first of all, you know, with the reaction being sad, angry, um, and uh, full of rage and fearful, because, you know, I have a, a, a young black male at home. One night he was saying, it was, it was late, it was after dark. He said, I wanna go down to the protests. I, wanted, I just wanna go down there. I just feel like I need to go down there. And I looked at him and I was, and, and this fear kind of crept up and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and, and that was my gut reaction. Um, but then I, ha I know that as a young black male, he wants to do, we all want to do something, right? But that was his um, just visceral reaction at that, at that time. So I needed to kind of check myself. And I know that when, uh, I, I needed to check myself and uh, let him ab be able to um, express his rage and his opinions about this. Um, in his own way, so he is going to attend a protest, um, you know, but I do have particular parameters, but, and, and I'm scared if he attends a protest. Somebody died um, during a protest. So, um, so it's the pit in your stomach when you have black and brown children in this country, that pit in your stomach that continues to grow as they get older, so. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to ask, open this up to the Boatmans and Ms. Uh, Myrna. Um, I know that you guys have some pre-existing health conditions that make it difficult to, to leave the house. How, how, how is it being stuck in the house with all of this going on? And how are you dealing with this ability, like this, all these high emotions? Are you able to feel that you're empowered, stuck at the house, or do you feel a little hopeless and powerless? I, I think at first you feel kind of powerless and, and that's a combination of just dealing with all that's happening and the reality that is um, the everyday life of a black person in, in America. Um, you know, you, you live with that fear for your kids. Then you have COVID, which puts a, a health risk involved. And our kids have said, we want to go to a protest. We want to be involved. And then you look and there's not really a way to be at a protest and social distance, right? Um, so we talked about what things we can do from our home with regard to making phone calls, with regard to fundraising, um, Mackenzie, I'll talk to you about with regard to donations and with regard to actually figuring out a way, um, there's a protest in our hometown, uh, this weekend. And we kind of thought, well, if we go and wait till the very last line of folks, and then we're at the back of the protest, then as we march with the people, we can socially distance ourselves. Um, so you, you want to be involved. There's a need to, um, to be involved and to be a part of the voice that is expressing um, 
concern and your outrage and disconsent and wanting to be a part of the voice that helps or supports the, uh, the notion of actual change being um, implemented. So it's, it's really difficult. And, and every one of us has a different perspective on, you know, whether or not Mackenzie is our, is our daughter that's most at risk and, and whether or not what it means if she were to go out. You know, one of my daughters was like, how can you go out? What do you mean? So it's, it's difficult because this is impacting our world and it feels like this is an opportunity for real change if, 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 there's, if people listen. Yeah. Mackenzie, you, you would like to share about your experiences and how you're helping fundraise and stuff like that. Myrna mentioned that. Would you like to expand on that? Absolutely. So a little bit about being at home. I, it's been very hard for me to just sit at home and watch all of my friends go out and protest and do all of these things outside of the house and just be stuck here because of my, um, because of having asthma. And if I had been at school, I know in my heart that I would be at, out in LA and I would be protesting but because I'm here and I do have to listen to my parents and I have to, they can tell me what I can do and what I cannot do. I'm not allowed to go out and do the protest and participate in the protest like I would like to be. And that has been really challenging for me. And, but I have found new avenues to do as help as much as I can go raising money and signing petitions and making the calls I need to, but it still doesn't feel the same as, you know, being out there and protesting along with everyone. And that has been really hard for me. Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to try to balance right now. You know, personal health, personal mental health versus the greater cause. Um, let's open this up to the West Coast, John and Coltrane. How are you guys, um, you know, dealing with this situation? I don't really know what's going on in Oregon right now as related to the protests, but I feel like this has an effect on everyone's mental health and aware, social awareness. What impact has that had on you guys? Um, well, for me as a student, it's been kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's been a hard time for us, like everyone, I suppose, just kind of balancing kind of fears of health risks versus, you know, a very real need to be able to participate and contribute to the movement and the change. Um, at home, it's been mostly going online and finding resources to learn more and joining petitions um, and contributing money. And mostly for me as a student, it's been a lot of having conversations with my friends about kind of the hardest subject for like a lot of us. Cause you know, growing up in Portland, it's a very white like space and kind of the issue of race is something that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about and discuss. So a lot of it has just been kind of broaching the subject more regularly and having it be the forefront of our conversations. You know, like I used to just call friends and like talk about all the nothing I was doing during my day with coronavirus. And now it's, it's very much more real discussions about like, Hey, how do we, how do we affect change from home or how do we affect change by going out and accepting the risk that so many other people have accepted, you know? Yeah, totally. That's, that's, totally the responsibility, especially of non-Black people right now, is to engage in that discussion, to maintain that level of, you know, this is not just for a week, you know, the, we have to continue this awareness and raising awareness um, for, for extended periods of time till actual change is come. Uh, John, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, the main effect has been a lot of sleepless nights because, <clears throat> So, you know, I was born in the early 60s, and um, so I was at least sort of around for, you know, the so-called long, hot summer of 1967, and, you know, there's so many parallels to that now, uh, so that's been occupying my thoughts. The other thing that I've probably been more productively doing is trying to figure out, okay, when the, when the immediate reaction fades how do we actually do something about it because it's a lot like coronavirus in some way it's a national tragedy but the solutions are all if there are our solutions they're going to have to be local uh because our federal government either won't or to some degree can't solve the problem at the local level 
So in Portland right now, you know, our police uh, department, uh, their union uh, contract is up for renewal, right? And so there are some very concrete decisions that have to be made about how that contract has to be changed, how the funding has to be changed, what directives they have to be given, what tactics and, and methods can and cannot be allowed. And so we are very rapidly gonna have to face the very complicated and detail-oriented issues of how do we make a solution uh, and so that's what I'm I'm kind of getting involved in I've been involved in local politics a lot in the last few years and I'm pretty tired of it I, my goal was kind of like at the end of this year I'm done and I've realized I guess I'm not yes yes definitely I think I think Thank you know you. Gonna, um, can I jump in Ben for a second yeah, absolutely there's a there's a question in the chat actually that um, about um, Coltrane. What, apologies for the uh, sirens in the background. Um, Coltrane, um, Sonia Gonzalez would like to hear a little bit more about the conversations that you referenced that you're having with your friends and what kinds of things you're talking about, um, and whether or not you have any thoughts about sort of what you know. Is there a common language that we could adapt adopt in in having these conversations? Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, yeah, it can. Um, I guess the things that we're talking about lately has been like the responses to this police brutality, condoning or condemning rioting and looting, and kind of the complicated, I don't know, the complicated drives and reasons between both sides of it. Um, that's kind of been the forefront. Um, otherwise, we've kind of just been talking about like ways of affecting change and kind of ways that, I don't know, kind of talking about kind of our own implicit biases, you know, that are kind of hard to own up to, but kind of have to be talked about. Um, the common, as far as the common language of the conversation, I don't really know exactly what that means, honestly, but I feel like it's mostly just the topics you know, the kind of the recurring topics, um, kind of talking about the examples that our peers are setting for us and kind of the new standard that kind of we're feeling we have to be held to now, just kind of seeing all these people that we admire and that we respect and that, that we like care about making brave decisions and taking action and kind of understanding that we, you know, if we want to be able to respect ourselves and respect and be able to be admired by our friends, we have to join in. Um, yeah, I, oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, this is great, go ahead, Cass. Um, I was gonna say I'd like to add on to that point because I've been having numerous amounts of conversations with my friends. Um, I've grown up in, surrounded by people who don't necessarily look like me and Mackenzie and I have grown up together um, and we've kind of have, a similar viewpoint on this that all, a lot of our our friends yeah okay I have a black friend but that's my black friend so I know what I know how they feel but that's not really the case it, being the token black friend in a group full of 30 people of non-color it's it's kind of hard because you really don't have someone to relate to. And my mom has always told me, there's always a sense of comfort when you're surrounded by people who are like you. So having these conversations with my friends this past week, and they've been difficult conversations, and I have lost a couple of friendships because of it, because not being able to grasp the reality of the situation is hard for some people, but it needs to be done. and one thing that I've learned through college is that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and that inspires change and having these conversations will definitely help with that and definitely get people on somewhat of the same level not everyone's gonna agree and you're entitled to your own opinion which is fine but we just all have to recognize that we're all human we all bleed the same blood and there's nothing wrong with that and I was just going to add on that I've had a lot of conversations and I found it really interesting to see what type of conversations I'm having with my home friends that I've always grown up with and then my college friends who I got to choose a year ago. 
And I found that with my home friends, it's a lot of explaining why this is happening, explaining why, trying to get them to, even though they want to agree, that's just ingrained to them. We learn the hate, we learn the division that we're, that is bred into us. So I think those are what my conversations have been with them, but with my college friends who I learned, who I met two years ago, it's a lot of, they are with it. They are fighting for the movement, but it's their families who we're having conversations of how do I talk to my parents? How do I talk to my family members who are my elders? So I'm supposed to respect them, but I want to debunk all of these ideas and all of their beliefs that are so racist, so, so many issues. But so I think for my, for my college friends, what it's been a lot about is them helping them talk to people who are older than them to pe- helping them change the world around them. And then with my high school friends, it's more helping them change themselves and their own beliefs. Uh- Interestingly enough, I just would add that I, I think even as, as an adult, you find yourselves in many of those same conversations. I've, we have um, a friend who we've known and I, I would say is, is just like family. And they said to me, this is the first time that I've really understood or, or been in a place where they heard those conversations differently, meaning the conversations of being a black parent, I worry about my black children who go out in the street, just in driving, you know, I I tell my kids they have to be careful about who's in their car and what those people might bring into the car because being the only black person in a car full of non-black people, if the police stop you, you're the person they're gonna look to and think that, that those, whatever it is, is happening based on you. And he said, I never really understood that before until this. So it's interesting how you can be in a conversation with people all the time and they discount it. And it takes one thing in the world that makes you kind of change and go, okay, we'll listen. And okay, I'm benefiting from something that I just really didn't understand before. And I want to put the question to you. How are, how is this sort of moment in time and you know, some of the things that, that folks have shared already, how's that impacting you and being home? Um, I think it's, you know, it's just tough. It's all around. It's, um, you feel uh, powerless. I went to a protest on Friday um, and I felt like that was the right place to be and the right thing to do, but it doesn't feel like it's enough. Um, you know, like sometimes you look at the, the, the mountain, it feels like we're climbing and it doesn't seem like it's, we're getting any closer to the top, you know? Um, and, you know, you see the similarities between the 60s, the 70s, the 80s and 90s with police uh, violence against the black community. And, you know, you, you, like, I, I thought I missed out on 2014 uh, with Eric Gardner and Michael Brown and Ferguson. I thought, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement had came and went. But then, you know, it, it gets, it's, it, it's just re-sparked. And while I'm old enough now to participate in it and, and play a role in it, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know what to do all the time. And I feel like that, that has an effect on mental health and your ability to actually believe in the cause, but you know you have to, so. So I, I'll say that um, as a parent, and I'm curious to hear from, from other parents, um, you know, for me, one of the things that has been most um, challenging maybe, or the tension has been between having Benjamin come home um, and he's a rising senior and he's used to sort of being on his own and making his own choices about when he comes and goes and where he comes and goes. And, and suddenly we're living under the same roof um, under this kind of a crisis and um, he wants to be on the front lines and Friday is not the only time he was out at a protest. Um, And I, you know, ideologically, I think that that's exactly where we need to be. Um, And also I am his mother and he is a brown boy. Um, And the tension there um, in, in terms of wanting to say, no, you can't go. Um, And knowing that I kind of can't do that, um, and that um, he's a young adult with sort of his own mind um, is has been difficult to navigate uh, for for me. Um, And and we've also had, you know, interactions uh, that have been less than positive with with the police. Um, What what Benjamin failed to mention was that he'd been pepper sprayed at the 
um, protest on Friday. And um, I happened to be there as well. And, and we were also then, you know, later on um, surrounded by police in riot gear. Um, so, you know, the, the tensions and the stresses are, are very, very real. Um, and I'm just wondering how the other parents um, maybe can share your experiences in, in navigating kind of my baby went off as a baby and now they're back and this other kind of person, or at least partially this other kind of person. Um, John, do you want to share? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, I think I'm probably having a similar experience to a lot of the rest of the parents here. The difference between my son, you know, when he was last at home and now that he's at home is pretty striking. It's, it's remarkable. It's, sometimes it surprises me. Um, and the one thing I'm also learning is that this experience, like I sort of thought, oh, great, he's going to be at home and his development will just be frozen. You know, he won't be learning. He won't be going to school. He won't be with his friends. He's just going to be in stasis. And actually, I have uh, figured out that he is maturing just as much through this experience as he was, you know, when he was living on campus. Um, in maybe in more inward ways, maybe in more ways about like self-discipline and productivity. So that's been, been pretty interesting. Myrna, Kelly, jump in. Kelly? Well, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, John, I agree with you. You know, you see that you're, you're like, oh my God, what are they doing now? Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, it, it's just going to stagnate, you know, their development. But I've, I've noticed that, especially, you know, with Helen, just um, trying to navigate and just as not related to uh, the recent events, but just trying to get an internship, things like that. And the, and the steps that she's taken are, you know, you know, pretty mature. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I'm a little impressed. But um, in terms of the backdrop, um, now that we have this second wave of crisis, I, I call it, it, it's a second wave of crisis on top of a crisis. It's, um, it's challenging and you do, um, like I was referring to before, you know, that, that push and pull of, as a parent, you, you want to keep them here, but yet you, um, but if protesting is what they feel that they want to do, then, you know, they're not kids anymore. Um, but I think somebody had mentioned something about um, self-care and mental health and how draining it is. And if we found ourselves um, being a little bit more irritable, being um, um, weepy, being uh, short fuse, things like that, those are the tolls that, uh, that this environment takes on our mental health. We had that already in, in COVID, you know, that, you know, we were stuck in a box or stuck wherever with our families. But now you have this tension of what's going on in the world, um, uh, this other pandemic of what's going on in the world. And I think that it's important that um, we don't saturate, or I feel very strongly about this, that we don't saturate ourselves too much with media, that at some point, um, you got to turn it off. You got to take some self care. You've got to back away from it and do what you need to do to kind of recharge and refresh because having a constant, um, a constant input of all of, all of, of the, of the visuals of the, uh, you know, the audio, it's, it's a lot. So, um, I, I, I know that if I could say nothing else is it's so important to kind of step away from from it at, at periodically and and recharge so and i i think i would just say that i um you we've gone through various stages right you do go through the all of my children are home i have four kids and they're all at home and you go through the well you're treating them like they were when they were all in you know secondary school when they were all in high school and you realize that and they show you they demonstrate that they are are becoming full-fledged adults. Um, the expectations are different. I can't tell you the number of times where I said, you need to do something and they've already checked that box, right? It's already done. Or um, 
just the supports that they're giving. I, I was laughing. I said, the one thing that COVID and all of this has done, the gift that it's given is it's given us a time to pause as a family for a period of time that we never would have had to kind of really get to know each other as we are now. Um, and you talk about um, self care. I think it's important for us to recognize the impact of first COVID and all of the stressors that that brought on and the stress of, the stress of being exposed um, from all that happened with Floyd. I think that there is an understanding in the world of the experience of being a minority that's different, that, that should have been there. We've all been experiencing it, but that the world wasn't aware of. Um, and I think that that adds to it, right? It's, it's the conversation that Coltrane talked about, about the push and pull of, or, or the discomfort of having that conversation. And I think that we've had those conversations as a family. We've had those conversations with our friends and we're helping each other process all of that. So I think that that's kind of been the gift of being together. Um, so. Uh, there's some questions coming up in the chat that I think um, are, are sort of germane to some of this. Um, the, uh, Michael Boatman is asking um, whether or not there are any generational differences that we've noticed um, in perceptions of the protests and, and whether or not um, and there are any disagreements among us about sort of next steps or, you know, parent and child kind of like how, how we're each seeing them, the protests or how we're um, thinking about next steps. And I think one of the things that um, Benjamin and I have talked about is, um, some of the uh, acting out that happens at, at these protests, right? Um, whether it's you know the throwing of an empty bottle at the uh, at the at the lineup of the officers um, or the you know profanities and those kinds of things, and in those conversations, I definitely feel old um, because I adhere to sort of a, a particular model of, of protest, um, and and Ben has taken a different stance somewhat, right? Um, do, do, do you feel comfortable sharing about that, Ben? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, for me, my experience at the Barclays was we were peacefully protesting. Um, the police decided to pick up their barriers, rush us, and pepper spray simultaneously. Um, at that point, I did not feel very peaceful. Um, but I also recognized it's not my place in the movement to make this about me and my personal feelings. Um, that being said, like, we've had conversations, you know, you're like, you got to do more than a protest. And you're talking about vote. We've always had discussion, uh, talk about voting, talk about voting. I don't think the institution that is established is works for anyone that's not uh, an elite capitalist. Um, that's just my perspective, right? Anyone can have their own, but I know it doesn't work for black and brown folks, right? Like, I know that you can't debate that with me. Um, you know, she, she, we talked a lot about the difference in the presidential elections, right? If Hillary Clinton was president, would this be different? I say Hillary Clinton describes young black people as super predators. I also say that when Obama was president, this was, was when the Black Lives Matter movement really started. Um, not to get too political and stuff, but you know, when we talk about like black lives, it's, it's not that political, you know? Like, it, they're important, they matter. Like, um, and I don't know how, what vote would, needs to decide that. Um, but I don't think it comes from a vote. I think it comes from people. And this is the unrest when, when Black lives aren't valued. Helen, did um, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, so I have a little story, actually. Yesterday, my friend and I, were sitting by the waterfront because we live on the Hudson River and we were just talking about everything that's going on and this older white male came up to us he was probably like 65 maybe 70 and he said to us I heard you guys talking about this thing and I just want to know what's the point of protesting what's the point of all of all of this that's going on I don't understand why your generation's doing all of this during COVID you guys should be doing an online protest and all this stuff. And I, I was taken back because one, we were having a private conversation. Two, he brought up COVID 
and he was standing like two inches away from me. So I started feeling very uncomfortable about that. And my friend and I, we, if this were to happen to like any of my other friends, I feel like I would brush it off. But my friend and I are very vocal about this particular movement that's going on. So we both, we, we stood our ground and that's something like I probably wouldn't have done in the past, but now um, I have a voice and I'm going to use it. And I expressed to him, there is so many things that are being done online and there are so many donation links, petitions that you can sign. Doing, there's an, there's doing an online protest. One, I don't think it would work. I don't know how you'd orchestrate that. Um, and also there's, there's a strength in seeing how many numbers came out to all these protests. And if you're going to hide behind a screen and do an online protest, it's not going to be taken that seriously. And I expressed that to him. And he was like, well, what's the cause? And I was like, police brutality, Black Lives Matter. Well, that's too many causes to be protesting for. I didn't, I really didn't understand this point. And he was trying to belittle my, my opinions and my friend's opinions. And we honestly just said, okay, thank you, sir. And then we dropped the conversation. It was going on for 10 minutes. We both felt uncomfortable. But in times like these, you need to stand up for what we're talking about. And I'm glad that happened to me. That's an experience that I will probably not forget, especially amidst this whole um, problem. But with the generational thing, they're just thinking that we're going out in the street and making a ruckus for no reason. There is a reason. This has been going on for years and years and years, and this was the boiling point. And it's, it's great to see that it's happening. Like many, many different people, young and old, are protesting, but there are still people who don't understand the point of it. And I don't understand why, but it's, it's, yeah. and, it's just, <laughs> sorry, just to bring it back full circle, I think this is why it is so important for people to reach out to those family members, those distant family members who you know might not be getting the exposure and may not be hearing all the things that we're hearing or seeing the things that we're seeing online and explain to them these are these this response and what's happening because you can get a very biased and directional view based on the media you watch and the people you're around. So I think it's really important for people who are with the movement, who are supporting the movement to yes, go out and have those uncomfortable conversations with your great uncle Sam and your blah, 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 whoever you want it to be, because that is the only way that those people are going to be reached. Coltrane, did you want to add anything on this? I don't know. I feel like everyone's spoken so like eloquently and beautifully about it already. I don't know what much more I could add. Okay. Um, yeah. How about this one? How about this one? Um, someone in the chat is asking about um, what, what you guys feel like you might need from your parents at this moment in time. Well, I'll address you specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I know for yeah, me, we'll do that in front of an, an audience. Go ahead. Me, um, <laughs> it's been uh, a struggle to balance my emotions and to be able to communicate with you um, because I'm still working on that as my, my own self, but especially with us trying to figure out where our relationship is now as a 22-year-old. You know, I don't, I don't always adhere to, you know, you asked me, you were like, when on Friday, when I was walking to the protest, you asked me, why are you going? Like, what, like, where did you, like, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, like, I don't have to, like, I have to ask you per for permission to do this. And then you asked me, are you socially distancing? But you asked me that when I was 10 feet away from Eric Gardner's mother, repeating the words, I can't breathe. Right. I didn't convey that to you, right, where my emotions were. Right. But I should have. Right. Like, but what did I do? I didn't respond to you. Right. Like, that's not healthy. Um, so for me, like being able to sit down and like later I was able to talk to you and you were able to, you were able to hear me. You know, I think all our emotions were very heightened. You were still able to hear me. Um, and I think I appreciated the ability to make a mistake. Um, and not maybe show you the level of decency that I should always show you. Um, but I was so wrapped up in myself that I couldn't, I didn't really know how to do that, you know? Um, 
what about everybody? What about Mackenzie? What about you? How are you? What do you need from your mom? So I think um, I am a very independent person in the things that I do and what I decide to do for everything. And I think that one of the, my siblings and I have always talked about, like when we went to African-American rights museums and things like that, would we be the people out there protesting if we lived in that time? That had always been a what if because, you know, it was years ago. And I think now, um, because I'm not able to protest, that's hard on me because I had always hoped that I would be that person. And if it had been any other time, yes, I would be out there, but thank you, coronavirus, I can't. So I think what I would need for my, what I want for my parents is more motivation to just do and to act because I think I just get so, I just give up because I'm like, I can't be out there protesting. I did what I can do and now I'm done. But I, there's so much more that can be done. There's more steps to be taken. There's more people to help. There's more people to reach out to. And I just, I think that is what I need. I need the encouragement and I need the push because I want to be that person who, I saw in those museums and who I saw, who I see today on the streets and I can't be on the streets, but I can still do it at home. Uh, I, I think, um, don't worry, I'll give you a push. <laughs> but I, I think the, the real thing that I would ask as a parent is, is, and I just realized in this conversation, you guys are all becoming adults. And so you kind of have to think of this as our infancy and in allowing that. We've been, you know, 20, almost 20 plus years being your parent of small people, of children. And so for us, we are just being reborn into this new relationship of dealing with each of you as you become adults. So you have to, you have to give an, a little, I would, I would ask on behalf of all of the parents on the screen and, and everyone listening, that you have to give us a moment to make that adjustment, right? To, to make the adjustment from being the person who has always had to look after you and make the decisions and choose what you did and did not do um, to the people who understand that we can turn that mantle over to you guys and actually allow and trust that all that we've put into you is going to come pouring out as beautiful as the beautiful adults you are. Um, so, so be gentle with us. Always, always. Um, John and Coltrane, I know um, you got, John, you have a daughter who's still at school. Um, and now a son that just came home from his freshman year. How has it been managing, you know, both the needs of a, of a child at home and away, you know, I, trying to give them their space, but also managing them during coronavirus and all these heightened emotions in the country? Well, I think um, what you said about giving space is pretty important. So a lot of times we don't really make problems better by hovering over it and, and just taking at it, you know? A lot of times we make problems better by just backing off and letting people process stuff. So, um, you know, I think it is perfectly fine to live in the same house with somebody and uh, not to speak with them all the time. It's perfectly mm -hmm. fine to be in the same room as somebody and do your own thing. And, you know, externally you're kind of ignoring each other, but, but you're just respecting uh, the fact that, hey, you know, normally the two of you would not be in the same room, but you are. Uh, and just, you know, how do you give people space? As for my daughter, so she's 100 miles away. Um, boy, I guess what I've mostly been doing there is uh, either enduring or enjoying, depending how you think about it, long FaceTimes, uh, where she vents about how angry she is about you know, there have been protests in Eugene and, and, and some of them have been co-opted for other purposes. And um, some of them have been misrepresented in the media. And, you know, she's done her part in, in correcting that. And I get to hear about it at great length, um, including when I'm at work trying to earn money. And that's, that's so that's what I do. Coltrane, what about you? What about, you know, starting your freshman year and then coming back home? How do you rely on your parents or try to get some space yeah um i do think it's kind of important to respect kind of to respect space and to respect uh the pre-existing relationship and not to force something that like hasn't really not to force something because of this kind of new situation living at home together um at the same time, I feel like it's really important um, 
especially kind of circling back to the last question about during this time of kind of upheaval and protests, how parents can like contribute and communicate with children. Um, I think it's really important for uh, the, the parent-child discussion to be had too. Um, I think it's, it's very easy for non-Black households to kind of avoid the conversation with our parents um, as well. Just speaking from my own experience, I've mostly had the conversations about this issue with um, kind of friends, um, with friends rem like remotely um, online or through social media. And I do think it's, it's really important um, to have these conversations in person amongst the family, much like you guys have exemplified, just uh, talking about, hey, how are we addressing this as not just individuals or parental units or children, but as a family unit together, you know? I feel like it's really important for families, especially to kind of stand together in this kind of issue, especially when like, you know, not all families are the same, not all families are living together, my mother's side of the family is very disconnected and trying to bridge, I don't know, bridging shorter dis distances if you're on the same page and just want to figure out ways to contribute together. And also, uh, in the strange cases, trying to communicate with others and explain how situations impact everyone and how situations impact particular people in unique ways that have to be addressed. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I want to say one thing about that. I think um, what I'm hearing as a common thread is sort of the idea of communication and um, trying to keep those lines open while also respecting boundaries, right? Space and, and, and those kinds of things. Space and silence as a boundary. Um, I think the other sort of reflection I had as I was listening to that is that, you know, we've got the dynamic of um, are, are children coming home unexpectedly mid-year and being quarantined because of or being sheltering in place because of COVID? And then there's this other layer of the tensions um, as a result of the current national climate. And, and um, you know, I don't feel, I don't fully feel like we have the language for that yet. And I think that some of the, some of the challenges that I've experienced with Benjamin um, and my daughter as well, um, have been around sort of not quite having the words yet to really capture and express the feelings that we're having and the layers of different things that are going on. Um, you're trying to process them in real time while you're also trying to find the words to articulate it, to communicate it to the person that you're living with. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, I, I think it's really, really challenging. Um, but I think it's the, the, the key, the central theme I've heard is, is that the idea of sort of trying to figure that out and working through it and, and keeping some doors open. Um, Myrna, did I cut you off? Did you want to add something? Um, no, I was looking, I'm sorry. No, I was looking at the, at the questions, no. So, so let's open this up to the Ishmaels. How are, you know, how have you guys balanced this? Um, you know, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's like very similar to a lot of people have said um i myself like mackenzie said that um am i i'm very independent and i like to do things my certain way um so i guess my input would just be like patience and similar to what diane was just saying like patience and communication is um something that's very important with a parental and student relationship at this day and age um yeah, that's that's all I gotta say for now. <laughs> there, there was a yeah. Go ahead. I, sorry. Oh, sorry. I I agree, and I think that it was very it was um, serendipitous. I think that as you were talking about the language and kind of navigating things in the moment, that on the screen there was a. Uh, a uh, information about texting for a uh, counselor or a mental health professional. And I think that that is so important in these times that uh, already we were facing some uh, uh, mental health crises with the COVID uh, pandemic. And now you have this on top of it, our second 
pandemic. And I think that I just want to put a, a plug in there for um, seeking professional help, um, talking to somebody kind of, so that you can understand all of these emotions that are going on at the same time. You've got your, your health, uh, your physical health, and then you've got this nation that's mourning and angry and fighting and, it, and these tensions. So um, if you need some, some place to go talk about it, do so. So that's uh, my piece. <laughs> The only thing that I wanted to respond to, there was a question, there were two questions. Um, one question talked about how to talk to your children about the, the hate and the anger in the world as, as a, as a per parent of color. Um, it, and it's really interesting to me that I think we always walk the line between wanting to, to have our children understand from which we came, right? The 400 years of history um, that is America without them feeling as if they're diminished by that. Um, and I, and I think, um, sometimes you feel like saying you survived or we survived as a people is, is not enough, right? That, that we are here, um, you know, graduates from college, graduates from high school working or not working, but making it, our, making our way through this world, um, sometimes just doesn't feel like enough when they have to sit in a room and feel diminished. So I think that we have to be brave enough to say, yes, we survived and that our value is not dictated by someone else's words. Um, so that makes it really, um, it's, a, it's a tough conversation. Um, I don't know, um, I, we also had a friend who recently talked um, about the COVID virus and um, she's, from, she's Asian in, in, in appearance. So Asian means Chinese to everyone um, and she's not, but she had been racially, you know, profiled, but get, you know, you brought this here and she's like, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not Chinese and that's not the, how this got here. And it's just, we have to be sensitive. I, I would say to all of the non people of color who are listening, um, there are assumptions that people make and, and the first place to begin is an honest conversation about how those assumptions are causing you to create relationships or to shun relationships and, and, your, and how your comments or lack thereof can impact a friend, a stranger, a student sitting next to you in the same space. So you just have to be very mindful of how stereotypes creep in and then dictate our responses to things. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, so I wanted to just allow for uh, any last thoughts before we hand it over to um, Micah. Anyone want to share any sort of closing thoughts? Anything you didn't get a chance to, to say or anything that um, was shared that particularly resonates? Let's start with the young people. Benjamin? Um, well, personally, um, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out, um, having this conversation, you know, w with this group of people that I know and care about before this, um, I think it was really helpful. Um, and if you could find a way to simulate that, because um, we're trapped in our houses when we're not out protesting. So it does feel a lot like we're alone. Um, and I don't, I think the show of support proves that we're not. Um, and just keeping that in mind that like, this is not a battle that people are going through alone. Um, this is a nationwide and, a, and our pain is being felt worldwide. Um, so keep that in mind. I was just gonna say to the parents, everyone watching this and on the panel, we may be a little critical, but we appreciate everything you're doing, especially now that we're home. It's, we don't get to be parented very often now that we're older, but we appreciate everything that you're doing. And thank you and to all the kids, I feel, I feel you. I'm with your emotions. I know what you're going through. It's hard, but we're gonna make it through. <laughs> um, I agree with my fellow peers. And I just wanna reiterate that everyone has a voice and your voice matters and no voice is um, 
more powerful than everyone. Everyone has a say in everything. And just to be kind to each other because kindness is free and it's easy and it gets lost in translation with everything that's going on. That's all. <laughs> yeah, and honestly echoing Mackenzie's sentiments, just like thank you to everyone who takes the time to, I don't know, to teach someone else something really important, whether it's a parent, whether it's family and, or friends. Um, and I don't know, I guess, yeah, my closing sentiment would be uh, expressing understanding towards one another and trying to teach one another where we can, what we can. Kelly? You know, I think that a lot of people said um, really great closing uh, sentiments and I would just echo all of that and, and echo what I've said before in terms of keep talking to one another and when you need help, get that help from an, uh, uh, an outside professional. John? You know, just combining the kind of topics we've been talking about today, my last thought is so right now we're in a situation where the world um, is more frightening, more stressful, more <clears throat> hostile maybe than it has felt. Uh, not that it's been, but that it's felt um, for a while. And so, you know, inside your house, it should just be a refuge from that. So, you know, your kids are experiencing a lot of stress out on the streets. There's really no need to add a bunch of stress about the laundry or the dishes. I mean, who cares? Just chill. Thanks, John. <laughs> Myrna? You have That's ruined it for all of us. You have <laughs> no, ruined like, it. Oh. <laughs> Myrna? Okay, to my kids, Elders and Uncle John. <laughs> but to everyone else, I, I agree. I think that um, there are small blessings in every, in every bit of frustration that we find. I think I take so much solace in the fact that when you turn on, it's not just, it's not just New York, it's not just the states around us, it is the recognition internationally that things must change. Um, you know, every country is, has recognized what happened to Mr. Floyd and um, what that symbolizes. So I think the, that what I would hope is that, um, people take these conversations and continue having them and then begin to make demands on, I, I hear you Ben about voting, but I would say um, the, the best thing you can do with that vote is make demands, um, demand change. Don't go for the traditional candidate. And that's why I would say vote for Diane Morales for mayor of 2021. Oh, this ad brought to you by, um, <laughs> I, so I, I, I have the privilege of the next to last word. Um, I would say um, that it has been incredibly inspiring to me to center the voices of young people um, in this conversation. Um, you are all such a force and so remarkable and extraordinary and impressive. Um, and you give me hope that, um, that we might actually get it right in the future if we leave our future in, in hands like, in the hands of young people like you. So thank you. Thank you all for, for lifting your voices today. And uh, Micah, I think we're gonna hand it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane and Ben, for your wonderful uh, co-moderating -moderate, together. Thank you for, to all the panelists. Um, I get to experience most of you um, socially and I get to have these conversations with you consistently. So I'm so glad that you all were able to share you with not the world, but to me, the world, um, to another audience, to a new audience. Um, so they see how wonderful and special you are. So thank you very much because I know you did this for me. And, um, but I realize now that you all did it for each other as well, because I could tell from the dialogue and the interaction that you have with each other, it was important for you to have your voice heard about this. Um, so thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for opening the floor to us. You know, this is, this is important work and it's consistently done by black women. Um, 
leading our community and this is what it looks like so thank you so much <laughs> all right now um thank you audience for joining us on this conversation we will this will be um it's recorded and it'll be available again if you'd like to um see it on demand share with your friends if you think they will also appreciate this if they were not able to join us um we also have other conversations that we've had previously that are on demand on um, at the stevefund.org. So that's where you will find them and you will find other great information for you, your student of color, um, because the mission of the Steve Fund is to help students of color with their emotional health and well being. And I think through this conversation, we see how important that is and how important the Steve Fund is to this community. So thank you again and be at peace and health and safety during these very tumultuous times. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>